tonight. Evangelicals size up the Porter scandal. President Trump definitely wasn't elected to be our Sunday school teacher. Me Too skepticism in France. And critiquing robot art. Computer, get smarter! The White House struggled mightily today to answer questions about what senior aides knew about Staff Secretary Rob Porter and when they knew it. Are you saying that the chief of staff of this White House had no idea that Rob Porter's two ex-wives had domestic violence allegations against him when they made those claims to the FBI that John Kelly did not know that? Well, again, this is part of an ongoing investigation. We trust the background check process, and the chief of staff does not get uh, detailed updates about what may or may not have been alleged. The story is such a mess that Deputy Press Secretary Rod Shaw offered a rare mea culpa from the Trump team. I think it's fair to say that, it, that um, you know, we all could have done better over the last few hours or last, last few days in, in dealing with this situation. The source code for a core component of the iPhone's operating system was leaked and posted on GitHub, a popular code sharing site. The code is for an older version of iOS, 9.3, but it could allow hackers to find vulnerabilities in the current system. In a statement to Vice News, Apple said the security of its products doesn't depend on the source code staying secret. GitHub has now removed the code from its site. Syrian and Russian planes continued to pound eastern Ghouta, killing almost 200 people since Monday. And the United States is backing a UN push for a month-long pause in violence. The State Department cited recent reports that the Syrian government has once again used chemical weapons on civilians. The ceasefire would allow NGOs to deliver humanitarian aid and help evacuate hundreds of civilians. Meanwhile, in a rare move targeting the regime, the U.S. launched strikes overnight against pro-government forces in eastern Syria. The International Criminal Court announced today that it's opening a preliminary investigation to whether Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte and other officials have committed crimes as part of the government's war on drugs, specifically whether there have been extrajudicial killings. Since July 2016, thousands of people have been killed as part of the crackdown. Duterte's spokesman said the police operations are legitimate and that Duterte is, quote, sick and tired of being accused. North Korea marked the 70th anniversary of the founding of its army with a military parade. Just as it prepares to send its Olympic delegation, which will include Kim Jong-un's sister, to Pyeongchang, the parade aired on North Korean television, but unlike previous events, it wasn't broadcast live, and it seemed smaller than usual, even though it showed off what appeared to be intercontinental ballistic missiles. <laughs> President Trump addressed the National Prayer Breakfast this morning in Washington. Each year, this event reminds us that faith is central to American life and to liberty. Our founders invoked our Creator four times in the Declaration of Independence. Our currency declares, in God we trust. The speech was a chance to showcase how close he is to the white evangelical conservative community, but it's an awkward relationship. Grab him by the pussy. And it keeps getting awkwarder. The deepening Rob Porter scandal threatened to upstage the event entirely. Here's how Trump's White House handled Rob Porter, who had a restraining order taken out against him by an ex-wife who told police he used to brutalize her. Top aides, including Chief of Staff John Kelly, defended him. And they kept giving him more access to the President of the United States. Is that the Christian way to handle this case? At the National Prayer Breakfast, held at this hotel this morning, the answer, like so much else these days, seemed to come down to whether or not you support Donald Trump. I think he understands that our country was founded on Judeo-Christian values. I think that there's no way possible for President Trump, who is leading this nation, to know every single thing about every single person in his administration. Uh, for the most part, people of faith have sold their soul. Uh, in order to gain some kind of political access. I think Rob Porter's just one more 
illustration of the hypocrisy? I have no comment on that because I don't know enough about the situation. I can only say abuse of any kind is horrific and needs to be dealt with in a very just way. Pastor Steve Berger has attended the National Prayer Breakfast several times. This year, he was invited by the Israeli delegation. He's a textbook American evangelical conservative. This is about an opportunity. He's built a powerful church with around 6,000 members in a wealthy suburb of Nashville. This is about us being so gospel-centric that we look at our lives and say, I'm not taking my cues from the world. We met up with Berger yesterday to talk about what to outsiders is a hypocritical relationship between evangelicals and this president. I think the reason it connects with the evangelical community is they see someone who's lived a life that might be contrary to their values, but is actually doing things that are more in line with their values than people in the past who have lived lives according to their values, but haven't delivered the goods. President Trump definitely wasn't elected to be our Sunday school teacher, our Sunday school president. Uh, he was elected to be the commander in chief. So this is what it's about for you, what the president does versus how he lives his life. Ultimately, I would love for his lifestyle to also line up with what he does, but if I'm gonna take one or the other, I would much prefer that he does things that benefit the largest amount of people. Is he a Christian? Not my call. Berger's on the board of a similar breakfast held in Jerusalem, and he's a strong advocate for policies that favor Israel. That's what the National Prayer Breakfast is really about, the political power of the faith community in this country. Right now, the faithful like Berger are feeling pretty powerful. There's no question that President Trump is the most evangelical, friendly president in the history of the nation. Um, I think that the influence that evangelicals have had on him has been very positive. So I only see benefit to us being able to speak into the president's life and, and help steer him toward a more Judeo-Christian value. New data released this week shows U.S. coal exports rose an astonishing 60% in 2017. The industry added more than a thousand new jobs, and prices have jumped from just under $50 a ton in early 2016 to around $100 today. We have ended the war on beautiful, clean coal. But for the record, Coal isn't clean, and it's not really coming back either. What's happening is a unique and temporary confluence of unlikely circumstances. In the first six months of 2017, Europe imported American coal in eye-popping numbers. But in most cases, the demand was due to either brief nuclear power failures or political instability in Ukraine's coal region, which was so devastated that even Ukraine itself was importing American coal last year. Demand spiked in China, too. It bought 30% more U.S. coal in the first half of 2017 than in all of 2016, all thanks to the government's overly ambitious plan to close old, inefficient mines and lay off half a million coal workers. China wasn't prepared for the sudden drop in supply that followed and scrambled to import coal to keep steel factories and power plants running. China's likely to ramp up its domestic production again. And Europe is quickly pivoting toward wind and other sources of energy which means the great American coal spike of 2017 may be more of a last hurrah than a comeback. The Me Too movement has been roiling the United States for months now, and women in other countries are pushing for changes to their own cultures. But in France, unlike in the U.S., the movement's critics have been almost as vocal as its supporters. Yeah. 
you may or may not know that she is the founder of Balance Temps Pork, which is essentially the Me Too movement in France. Um, and she is here with us. I just want to thank her for being here today and for being extremely brave. After the Harvey Weinstein news broke last October, French journalist Sandra Muller publicly identified on Twitter the man she said sexually harassed her. You can't say, I like women with big breasts, you're absolutely like a product, like a piece of meat. Honestly, I'm not a piece of meat, I have a brain. Muller asked other women to out their own harassers, using the hashtag Balance Tom Pork or Expose Your Pig. Why was it so important for you to actually name the names? I thought Anonymous was too easy. You know, because you can write a lot of story and, and if you don't identify yourself and if you don't identify the guy, uh, I think it's it, it could be dangerous, you know? Why could it be dangerous if you don't identify the person? If you name the person, you can find some other people who, who are exactly the same situation than yours. It helps victims to express themselves, which is really good because they need to speak out. Thousands of women used the Balanced on Pork hashtag. It's ruined men's careers and reputations, including prominent academic Tarek Ramadan, who was accused of rape and charged last week. The man Muller accused of harassment, Eric Brion, admitted that the inappropriate exchange happened at a media industry party. But he says they never worked together, and he's no Harvey Weinstein. Brion is now suing Muller for public defamation. His lawyers said in a statement that Muller had denounced Brion arbitrarily and presented the facts in a misleading manner. Sandra's lawyer says sexual harassment is poorly understood in France. So why has he got a defamation case? So he recognizes the facts, but he says, we can't say that I'm a harasser on the plan sexual because I haven't committed any harassment at work. The burden of proof is now on Muller to show Brion made his comments to her in a professional context. If she can, she might be protected by France's existing workplace anti-sexual harassment laws. Is this a precedent-setting case? Oui, parce que il va permettre de déterminer euh, comment le juge comprend la réalité des différents milieux professionnels qui existent en France, ou s'il reste dans une lecture qui pourrait être très fermée. What will it mean if Sandra loses her case? Ça serait catastrophique en réalité pour les autres victimes de harcèlement sexuel. French women have been protesting en masse since October, demanding that their president, Emmanuel Macron, deliver on his promise to address sexual harassment, violence and equal pay. Parce que moi, j'ai le sentiment que ça fait des générations que les femmes essayent de parler de ce sujet et qu'on ne les écoute pas. The woman in charge of changing things is gender minister Marlène Schiappa, a 34-year-old feminist author and the poster child for Macron's social revolution. Schiappa's debuting a law that will create up to $900 fines for catcallers and a dedicated police task force, 10,000 officers strong. Le harcèlement de rue, c'est un phénomène qui, pour l'instant, n'est pas inscrit dans la loi. Donc, il n'est pas défini. Donc, pour nous, l'enjeu, c'est de savoir à partir de quand c'est du harcèlement, où ça commence, où ça s'arrête, etc. Et ensuite, comment on le sanctionne réellement. But what we're talking about here is is cultural change. How hard is it going to be, and how feasible is it to change the culture? Le plus difficile, c'est effectivement ce combat culturel. On le voit sur l'égalité professionnelle. Des lois en France qui interdisent de moins payer les femmes que les hommes. Il y en a une dizaine et elles existent depuis les années 80. Et pourtant, elles ne sont pas appliquées. Donc notre changement, notre, notre combat, c'est vraiment un combat culturel. Et c'est le nombre euh, qui, fait, euh, qui fait la force. But not everyone's on board. In January, famed actress Catherine Deneuve co-wrote a scathing op-ed published in France's biggest newspaper and accused Balance Tom Pork of helping the enemies of sexual freedom. 100 other prominent women also endorsed the letter, including conservative magazine editor and self-proclaimed feminist Elizabeth Levy. Do you see Balance Ton Pork as feminism? Ah non. Non, non. Je vois ça comme un phénomène effectivement d'hystérie collective. Je vois ça comme un appel à la délation. Je vois ça comme un renoncement à toutes les règles de la justice. Comment peut-on faire croire qu'on va obtenir la justice en abolissant toutes les règles, toutes 
Ça, ça s'appelle la justice populaire, le lynchage, la mise au pilori. Ça ne s'appelle pas la justice. Ça me, pour tout vous dire, ça me dégoûte, balance ton port. Do you think that the current moment could actually threaten to undermine French sexuality? J'espère que non. Alors maintenant, si vous voulez, qu'est-ce qu'elles demandent, ces féministes, en permanence qu'on interdise quelque chose? So, what do you think of Marlene Schiappa? I mean, she's talked about wanting to pass legislation to try and what she thinks like course Marlene correct. Schiappa, what do you think of Schiappa? Schiappa. Excusez-moi, elle est très sympathique, mais enfin, comment dire? Personne ne la prend vraiment au sérieux. Women on both sides have questioned how much power you really have. Is this all window dressing? Donc moi, j'ai l'impression que le pouvoir dont je dispose, il est important, mais bien sûr, tous les soutiens sont bienvenus. Donc si elles veulent m'aider à obtenir plus de pouvoir, en relayant davantage ce que je fais, par exemple, c'est avec grand plaisir. C'est très français, le « ça marchera jamais ». Moi, je pense que ça peut marcher si on s'en donne les moyens et si on fait les choses correctement. The walls appear to be closing in on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who finds himself in the middle of two different legal investigations. The first, Case 1000, alleges that the Prime Minister did favors for an Israeli movie producer who showered him and his wife with gifts. The second, Case 2000, alleges that Netanyahu cut a deal with the publisher of the newspaper Yediot Aronot that would have promised him favorable coverage in exchange for helping to undermine the circulation of the paper's rival, Israel Hayom, which is owned by American Sheldon Adelson, a major Republican donor. Netanyahu is famous as a political survivor, but with indictments rumored to be just days away, that legacy is about to be put to the test. Bibi Netanyahu is a polarizing figure abroad, but he's always fared better at home, where he's been prime minister for nearly a decade and his approval ratings are usually pretty solid, standing at around 80% in November, but he might be about to come unstuck. For nearly six months, Netanyahu has been an official suspect in these two cases, and it looks like he'll be indicted next week when the police hand their findings over to the Attorney General. Netanyahu has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing, and he put out a video on social media on Wednesday responding to the charges. <laughs> Whether the allegations are false or not doesn't really matter. If he's indicted, he'll be expected to go. Has there ever been a precedent for this in Israel? Yes. But the precedent is with former Prime Minister Olmert, the minute that he was, he was indicted, he resigned. So the allegations were there, but he didn't stay as Prime Minister. As it happens, Olmert ended being convicted of taking bribes and spent a few years in, in jail. If Netanyahu is indicted, and he does step aside to fight those charges, the Likud party needs to find a new leader, and there's no clear replacement. And if Likud does elect a new leader, that probably means fresh elections, much sooner than the planned vote in late 2019. Polls show that if there are new elections, the centrist Yeshatid party would gain the most seats. But that may be inevitable. For now, most insiders think Netanyahu's days are numbered. It's difficult for me to see if Prime Minister indicted of bribes can still function as Prime Minister. I think if he leaves office, it will be well him and, and probably his family kicking and screaming and play the ultimate victims. I'm looking for humanity here, dignity, horror, ah, originality, something, something. That's what we're looking for.
It looks very, very vaguely like kind of mid 20th century French abstraction. I will not name any artist because I don't think any artist was this boring. Next. It's very distantly related to a painter named Lisa Yaskevich, always painted women in candy-colored worlds, naked and semi-naked. That is pretty interesting work, and it can really creep you out. And then cut to your core. This painting doesn't cut deep. Have a better idea, have a better idea of space, subject matter, surrealism, anything other than a kind of bad uh, album cover from the 1970s. I have a rule on my Instagram. No pictures of food or dogs. But I don't hate this. What this is doing is what we call horror vacui, the horror of a vacuum. Northwest Coast American Indian art has that, where it fills up every single area. There's a face within a face, within a bird, within a bird. But dogs? Well, the computer has looked at a lot of Shepherd Fairey's great poster of Obama from 2007 and 2008. Of course, the computer has made Obama look more like a white JFK, so your prejudice is showing again. But still, pretty much you have a good uh, knockoff of Shepard Fairey. This is the first image I've seen that doesn't look like a computer made it. The robot really likes post-impressionism. That's good taste. Could I mistake it for a real person's hand? Sure. It certainly doesn't make it better. The work I've seen today, does it come close to art? Not for me. It may for you. We have the most amazing tool ever. It's like fire, like the camera, like birth control. You want to see what you can do with it. So let's get busy. Get to work. Bring your inner anal retentive warrior and go to work. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, February 8th.